Welcome to Model Steam Engines and Boilers Part 29. Working on larger steam engines is often easier than working on small ones. And if you have a lathe that's big enough to do it, building larger steam engines is often much easier than building the very small ones. This steam engines and boilers video is a compilation video and contains edited clips for a series that are made in 2017, the title of which is on screen at the moment. A Stuart 5A steam engine is not really a model steam engine, it's a small full size steam engine, capable of developing 1.5 horsepower if it's fed with steam from the boiler at £80 per square inch. This is quite a nice example, it's very well made when I first look at it, it's not very well assembled, it's a bit of a mess in that department, and one of the bearing top caps is actually broken, more about that later. But the rest of the engine looks very good, the parts are very well finished too. I'm removing the bolts from the bracket that hold the valve gear to the steam chest. And as per usual, all the nuts and bolts go in one of these green containers you can see to the left, that way I don't lose them. Once the bracket was removed, I thought it would be a good idea to give it a clean first, because there's bits of oil underneath all of the parts on this engine, and I'm going to get very oily indeed. So I'm going to clean the engine as I go, although I won't be showing it all in the video. After removing the reversing arm bracket, I then removed the die block from the expansion link, and it's very important not to lose this component, so I'm putting it back complete with its pin in the valve fork. That way I know where it is. The valve fork is very loose on the shaft. It's a bit of a rattle fit and I will have to do something about this. I would think a bit of Loctite should sort it out. It's quite important with any fittings on shafts that are threaded that the fittings are tight. If they're sloppy then the valve gear events will also be sloppy and this can cause problems both when setting up the valve gear and when the engine is running. This is something I would never do and I'm doing it here because the key is so slack it's just coming out anyway. I'm using a pair of snipe nose pliers as a wedge. Generally I would start off with a wedge piece of wood and see what that does followed by a wedge piece of brass and if all else fails then a wedge shaped piece of steel. The bolts for the eccentric straps are really tight at one side and slack at the other side. And I'm being very careful not to round the end of the nuts and bolts using my adjustable spanner. And I know a lot of people hate adjustable spanners, but I love this one. It's a Barco, and Barco adjustable spanners are very good quality. And by using this adjustable spanner, it saves many hours of looking for individual spanners. I mentioned earlier about the broken bearing top cap, and here it is. When I examine this broken component closely, I can clearly see that most of the metal in between the two parts is very, very dark, apart from a very thin line of lighter coloured metal, where it finally broke off. So what I'm going to do, for a couple of reasons, one is it's quicker, and the other is it will make an interesting video, is I'm going to repair this, and if it doesn't work, if the repair is unsuccessful, I'll just make a new part. Time now I think to remove the flywheel, and in common with the keyway at the other side, the key is very slack, it popped out with no pressure at all. So when I come to reassemble this engine, I have choices. 1. Make new keys. 2. Use shims to make sure that the keys are a tight fit in the slot. This is a view of the top cap that isn't broken, and I think I can see one of the possible reasons that the other side top cap was broken. These two gaps are supposed to be the same. The top cap has been put in at a very clumsy angle and any over tightening going on at this angle is just going to smash one of the side lugs. On screen at the moment is a magnified view of the main bearing brasses and as you can see I've put the bolts back in so I know which side fits where. Thankfully there's only one bolt holding the cylinder to the standard and as you can see the cylinder now swivels around once I remove the bolt and I can lift the cylinder off the piston. Here it comes. And there is a piston, thankfully complete with its two piston rings. Two cast iron piston rings in a very well machined cast iron cylinder. So all I have to do now to remove the lower cylinder cover, the gland assembly and the connecting rod is take off the nut. And once that's done, the entire assembly just slides out. I'll put the nut back in place just so I don't lose it. Right, so it's this crankshaft, it's not going to come out at all. The only way I'm going to get this crankshaft out is to undo the two bolts, and there are only two of them that are supposed to be four, 
that hold the standard to the main bed plate. I will then be able to lift the standard slightly and withdraw the crankshaft with ease. And here, without the aid of a safety net, I remove the nuts, lift the standard and withdraw the crankshaft without dropping the standard on the floor. This is part two, cleaning the parts and checking the fits. And here's a spare crankshaft. Not something that you normally have laid about in your workshop, but I have. This was a new old stock crankshaft that I bought, and it's very useful for comparing fits with a micrometer. It speeds everything up. So instead of taking a measurement from the crankshaft that's with this engine, and then looking at all the numbers, then comparing the micrometer readings with the numbers on the drawing for a 5A, which of course I don't have, this just makes it a whole lot easier. A micrometer one, and then move on to the second one, and compare the micrometer readings. And now, without fear of contradiction or criticism, I can compare crankshaft number one, the brand new one, with crankshaft number two. And the good news is, crankshaft number two that belongs to this engine is perfect. In fact, the only difference between these two crankshafts is the presence of a hole here, and also a hole here. There is a way through from one hole to the other, so any oil applied to the crankshaft main bearing automatically finds its way down to the big end bearing. Very ingenious. This crankshaft does not have this facility, and I'm certainly not going to try and drill a hole at that angle all the way through that mass of hard metal. But what I'm going to do is check the concentricity of the crankshaft, and it's currently in my lathe, and I'm using this gadget which is called a dial test indicator. And basically it's a plunger, and as the plunger moves in and out, it gives a clock reading. So I've set it to zero, and when I rotate the crankshaft, you can see that the crankshaft is not true. Oh, shock horror. It's at least one thou out. But really, I think we can live with this. One thou over that distance is not much at all. It's worth bearing in mind that this is just a one and a half horsepower simple steam engine. It doesn't go very fast. It is not a supercar. It does not tear around a track, and it does not need to have the tolerances of a modern supercar. That is it for this episode of Steam Engines and Boilers. Stay safe, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.